All right. Hello, fans, and welcome to another episode of High and Tight coming to you live on our social platforms via StreamYard. I am John Nolan, the Prep Baseball Northern Virginia Scouting Director. Joining me this evening is the Virginia DC Scouting Director, Jason Burton, and the Virginia DC Assistant Scouting Director, Jordan Jones. Jason, Jordan, how are we doing? Doing pretty good. Pretty good. Amazing. I'm following Jordan's energy. <laughs> Is, uh, everyone thawed from uh, Monday and Tuesday? Not quite. I'm still, I'm still kind of frozen, you know. My, Monday may have been the coldest night of my life. Uh, I will concur with that. Monday was way, way, way up there. That's for sure. It Wednesday was, was Wednesday was windy, but Monday at Mountain View was just absolutely brutal. Yeah. Monday, I was at Kettle Run Fuck Year. That was, I, I guess someone tried to explain to me that it's at the bottom of a hill in a wind tunnel, but I, it does not matter. It was just cold. Um, All right. So uh, on tonight's episode, we're going to discuss our new Power 25, which we'll release on the website tomorrow morning. Um, standout players that we saw in our travels this week. And then we'll actually take a minute and we'll look ahead to the Commonwealth Classic, which somehow or another is next Saturday, believe it or not, right? Uh, Burton, have you looked at the weather for you so right now? No, I have flashbacks of last year. We'll, we'll look at the weather forecast like Wednesday. <laughs> I was about to say flashbacks to last year, flashbacks to first pitch, uh, whichever time that we tried to do something and Mother Nature said no. Jordan and I have like freaking go into like, you know, itching and withdrawals and stuff like that, thinking about and I and I look Miller School is beautiful and nice, but uh you talk about a, an extreme pivot from Colonial Heights to um to Crozet, uh Virginia just just on a whim. Um that yeah. was that was an elite experience. Big that training. was so that was a day. There's there's just no other way to describe it. That was that was a day for sure. Um, and we even got most of our stuff in at Hanover. So um, once the rain finally decided it was done. But, yeah, I do not envy you guys that drive, being at Shepard and then having to run out to Miller. So, all right. Well, we'll, well get the back wind, to that. The wind was – no, I was going to say the wind was so bad there. I remember talking to Jordan about – I was worried we were on that mountain and you got all the trees everywhere. I legit was worried that we had brought, you know, Greenbrier Christian from Chesapeake, Virginia to Charlottesville. And they were all in, they were all about it. And we get the second in and and then like a tree falls on a power line and we have no lights. And (laughs) I was just like, Oh, this is, this is going to happen. This is my day. I just remember on their way to to Charlottesville, they got out at Hanover and they were like watching the first game at my field. And I like see them because they're all in uniform. They're on their little the Greenbrier Christian bus that they ride around everywhere. And I like walk over to to one of the players. I'm like, why are you guys here? You're at the wrong field. And they're like, no, we're taking a pit stop along the way. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank God. All right, um, so let's actually get into what we're here to talk about and not burn our time. So tomorrow on the website, we're going to run our first update of the Power 25 for the 2024 season. Uh, there's going to be some significant movement. We've got a lot of changes. We've had two weeks of action. A lot of teams have played four, five, and six games, and there's a few that have played one. Um, so I don't want to spoil everything for the release um, or for later in this chat that we're going to discuss uh, but a big thing that happened this week was we had a matchup between number one and number two in the old rankings and a big WCAC showdown between St. Paul the sixth and St. John's on Tuesday night in the wind in Northern Virginia. And in a marathon three hour plus game, Paul the sixth beat St. John's. Um, so decent chance we might see a change at the top of the rankings. I don't know if we want to release that now or wait. Um, also, there's a team that we thought might be a year away in Class 6. They've come out in dominant fashion off to a 4-0 and start. Um, overall here, so looking at the new Power 25, because we're looking at it, you guys can look at it tomorrow on the website. Uh, Jordan, what are your takeaways right now from the update, just in general? I mean, well, obviously the Power 25 uh, had some early shakeups early in the seasons, some upsets, um, some teams going down. So definitely some sneaky teams in the state that are 
little bit ahead than what we thought. Um, but it's just good overall to see the depth that uh, that we have going so far with some younger teams taking out some of the bigger teams early on in the season. Oh, absolutely. New blood moving up and taking out some of the veteran teams is always a good thing. Uh, so, uh, Bert, what are some of the teams to watch in the next week or two uh, that could possibly be jumping in or are close to doing so? Um, especially here is where it's spring break. Teams are on, or for some of the states, teams are on tournaments. The rest of the state will go on break next week. Um, so th there, there's a lot of possibility here and a lot of mobility that can happen. So what are some teams to keep an eye on? Well, I think my biggest takeaway is just the the weird and strange fact of like people, you know, chirping staff members about Power 25 rankings and just making just very odd and off the wall comments and stuff about power 25 and where their team is ranked and this, that, and the other, like, it's just very strange for people to do that, but it happens. Um, I think, you know, people got to understand, Hey, Hey, this is not like, you know, backtracking or anything like that on, on what we rank. There were three teams inside of our power 25 rankings who lost arms some multiple arms for the season that we had no idea about, you know, because people don't outwardly advertise, you know, it's not ESPN, right. It's not, not, uh, we're not D one baseball and we get, you know, it's, it's not, you know, SIDs putting out, uh, you know, but this guy had Tommy John and left the school and this, that, and the other, like we don't get those updates. So we're we not get them after we put bombs the or Burt bombs or Jones bombs. No, no, no Woj bomb news. Yeah, no, like we don't we don't get those updates. I mean, like I said, it was three teams, and and you know those three teams are still going to be pretty good, but they're not on the same level that they would have been at with those players. Um, so everybody just take a breath, and and our staffs at a game trying to work and trying to help players just leave them alone. Um, but I, I think the the youth movement of one of the teams coming in is pretty impressive. Um, I think the the, the bolts, as they call them, uh, the Light Ridge uh, lightning bolts or whatever. Um, I think they've they've had an impressive early season start, beating Freedom. Um, the, the offense is – I got a chance to see them the other night, and I'll get a chance to see them tomorrow. The offense was pretty uh, pretty intriguing. Um, and, and, you know, they got a solid arm at the top and Mason Sprout, who's back healthy. Uh, so they're definitely a team to – watch um you got some other teams moving in um and and honestly just some teams just haven't lived up to the billing that their roster shows uh and i know it's early um but some teams are coming out hot firing and ready to go um and some teams i don't know if they just like kind of coasted into it thinking their talent alone on the roster was going to get them through um but there'll be a lot of change throughout the season regardless no, absolutely. And I will say this, if we hear about player injuries, it's not our place to necessarily publicize that. So we wouldn't honestly, um, unless it's been no, publicized we, somewhere else. No, we in wouldn't like, publicize it, else. but we would take it right. into – yeah, but we would take it into account when we're ranking a team for sure. No, I know. I'm just saying in general, just throwing that out there as a disclaimer, if we hear about someone's injury, that's that's not our business to tweet or share. Um even unless it's already out there somewhere else. All right. So again, power 25, uh, tomorrow on the website, make sure you check your update. Uh, Jason top of your head right now. Are we going to wait two weeks here again on this with uh breaks going on, or are we going to go ahead and roll it again next week and start doing every Monday? No, I think we'll go every Monday. Um, because most everybody, uh, most everybody's playing this week in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, most of the Nova teams are on break, but they're, you know, they're playing, um, especially your uh, more premier programs, if you will. Um, most all of them are playing. And uh, and some of the teams that are on break, I know a couple are in our tournament. Um, so they'll play on Saturday. So we'll get two games in before that next update. Um, so, yeah, the plan is to update every single week. Um, and then we'll release private school top 10 this Tuesday. All right, there you go. So um, every Monday, starting tomorrow, updated Power 25 throughout the high school season, private school top 10 rolling on Tuesday. 
Uh, we'll probably wait a couple more weeks, but eventually we will get to doing a small school top 10 as well. So um, let's go ahead and shift our conversation here. Let's talk about player standouts. Guys have been running around like chickens with their head cuts off uh, or heads cut off. Pardon me. Um, so every week we're going to discuss players that stood out. Um, I do want to point you guys towards our scout blogs. Those are going to be much more detailed notes. Uh, Nolan's notes, my releases on Wednesdays, Jordan's on Tuesdays, Burton puts two out one a, um, a week, Mondays and Thursdays, much more detailed information on those stories. So please, um, go to them, but we're going to briefly talk about all of the games that we were at this week as we go here. Um, so far on the season, our staff in two weeks plus some scrimmage time has seen 41 games and 70 different teams. I'd say that's pretty good for two weeks, right, Jordan? Yeah, sounds good. I love it. I love it. I feel like Burton thinks we're behind pace right now, right? I always think we're behind. Foot's got to stay on the gas. <laughs> All right, um, so we have games to talk about, teams that we saw. I'm going to go ahead and tip this one off to Jordan first. Uh, first game you saw was Chatham and Halifax. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you saw there? Yeah, um, when I went on Monday night, Halifax, they jumped out early. They dominated the game from the jump. Mason Hatcher got the start, and he controlled the game. Uh, he attacked the zone. He mixed pitches. Um, he picked up nine strikeouts on the night, but he started the tempo for them and he controlled the game to get them to a good spot uh, to hand the ball off later in the game. And Logan Clark really got the offense going for Halifax. He had a three hit night. Uh, he came up multiple times with runners in scoring position and he cashed in. So it was good to see him um, making a statement in that lineup and getting the offense going for them rolling. All right. So that was Jordan's first game. Um, Jason, while we're talking about the freeze box that was Monday night, I'll flip it over to you here. Uh, Forest Park Mountain View, you were up in Stafford. What did you see there? I saw a lot of runs, a lot of runs. Uh, I think uh, Mountain View put up like six in the bottom of the first. I was like, oh, this is going to be a five-inning one here. Um, I thought we were getting out of there early, and then I think fifth inning, we were like two hours and 15 minutes in. And, uh, and like mm, 17 runs total at that point, I think. Um, Forest Park came charging back, went up 7-6. Um, and then I think they made it like 10-7 or somewhere in there. And then uh, uh, IE, our conversation with our player of the week uh, from another game, I was headed back south because um, it was brutally cold. And I had already gotten like four at-bats on every single player. Um and I knew with a couple other district games, they weren't bringing in um, some of the front end arms later on in that game. Uh, and then it ended up being, I think, 12 10 with Mountain View staying undefeated and coming out on top of that game. Um, Marco and Miguel Smith, two junior twins. I guess they're twins. I imagine so. They're both juniors, they're brothers. Uh, just going to throw that, throw that uh, speculation, wild speculation out there. Um, but that is Marco with a home with a solo shot. Um, I want to yep. say it was like the fourth or fifth inning. Um, he, uh, he, he got inside of that pitch and elevated and got it out of there. Brother Miguel, um, had a big hit to kind of keep it in and going. He was on a breaking ball, uh, that loaded the bases right there, that single, um, and allowed them to, to score a few runs after that on some hits. Aiden Albright, VMI commit 2025. He was in center, um, long lean frame, looks the part. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> Had a hit, short to contact. He's strong, long strides, got some arm strength in the outfield. Uh, and then one guy I came away with impressed. I've seen video on the swing, never seen him in person. Really like the swing, way the swing operated on video. Uh, but was Will Fry, left handed hit and catcher for Forest Park. Um, got a ground ball by first base right here in this at bat. Um, and then worked a really deep at bat here, got a fastball and went left center, I believe, for a double. I think it was three, it was three RBI double. Um, it was a good swing. He he looks the part, compact frame. Um, we'll see where he ends up positionally, uh, but he can hit. All right. Um, okay. So then to my Monday night game, um, I went and saw a little rivalry showdown between Kettle Run and Fuck here. Always fun to watch these two. I, I try to make sure I get this game at least once a year. Uh, they face off twice. This one was the one at Kettle Run. Um, 
it really, really interesting game back and forth. It was really tight early. Uh, Jake Mulhern got the start for Kettle Run. He's pretty good early, actually. Punched out a bunch in the first two innings. Um, was low 80s, got up to 83. Uh, had showed some feel for his breaking ball. A little bit of different shape um, on it as well. So uh, 2025 arm there, Jake Mulhern. Uh, the, the kid just pitches. He's been Kettle Run's top arm for a couple of years now. Um, I thought he was really good early. The game was... Three to three for the longest time. And then in the top of the seventh, um, Fakir was able to actually really kind of break the game open, ended up cruising to a pretty big win there. Uh, but those games are always big fights between the two of them. The the one that I was really interested to see, and I didn't get a great video of him just because of circumstances when you're watching hitters, is 2025 catcher Jack Graham, who is back at Fakir after being a PG last year. Um, I the kid's physical. I, I like the athleticism. I like the way the swing works a little bit. Um, there's definitely some things there um, to like. I just he didn't get a ball that he like cleanly hammered at one point in time, but he had some good approaches, some good at bats, and so I really really like that. And I'm gonna probably make a point to try and get back out and see Graham again later on this year. So that was my Monday night. Uh, fuck you, taking down Kettle Run. Uh, Jordan, back to you here. Uh, Godwin Atley. Yeah, um, so the game kind of got out of hand early on um, due to some misplayed uh, hit balls by Atley. But, I mean, Goblin took advantage of it, um, scoring on pass balls, arrows, things like that. But, I mean, the pitching staff really dominated the whole game. Charlie Gunn got the start. Um, he set the tone for them, and then it was able to hand the ball off to their deep pitching staff. Zach Boyd got the ball, um, and he dominated in his two, two innings of work was 84 87 he got up to 88 um but the thing is for me his slaughter was really working um he set it up early and then just broke it off a little bit on the outside plate for later strikeouts and then to close out the game hunter ross came in and the breaking ball was really working for him he got ahead in the count with it and ended the count with it uh so it was really good to see him be able to land that breaking ball has been a little bit inconsistent in the last few looks that we had, but his, his ability to land it uh, was a good look for him. Um, and all three of the pitchers on the night, they picked up three strikeouts, so it was just a good showing of them as a staff, attacking the zone early, getting quick outs, and leading at, um, Goblin to 11-1 win. All right. Uh, Burton, your Tuesday night, you were back up in Northern Virginia a uh, couple nights in a row. I don't know what you're going to do with yourself. Um Woodbridge and Colgan, uh, what would you see there? Big showdown in the Cardinal District. Well, first off, I just love traffic so much that I just keep wanting to drive there. Um, but, no, uh, back at Colgan, um, got a chance to see a good matchup, an uncommitted senior, Aiden Ellerts, um, was on the mound for Woodbridge. Uh, I know, Nolan, you saw him last year and was really impressive, uh, especially with the ability to use the breaking ball. Um I thought it wasn't as clean of a look as, as you saw last year. Um, there's still a ton to like about the breaking ball. I thought he tried to go to the slider a little bit too much. Um, it just wasn't it just wasn't working as well as the curveball was. Um, I thought the curveball was working much better. better. Um, still mid-80s arm, showed a changeup. Um, I really liked the changeup. Uh, I thought it was his second or third best pitch on the night. Um, but definitely an interesting, uncommitted senior arm. And then definitely, honestly, the the driving piece of getting up there to that game on Tuesday uh, outside of Ellert's was Gavin Knox. Um, get a chance to see the 2027 Virginia Tech commit. It's been a while since we've seen him. Um, pretty proportional frame, uh, not super long, not necessarily compact, just kind of just kind of, you know, average frame. Um Pitch ability, throw strikes, uh, mixes in off speed. He threw two breaking balls. Um, I thought the slider was better than the curveball. He was getting around the curveball a little bit. Um, I want to say he was – I don't have it right in front of me. I know he was like 84, 86. I can't remember if he touched the seven. Um, but I know he was 84, 86. Held it fairly well uh, through the first two. Started to fade a little bit in the third. Um just a really strong out and just kind of just came right at hitters. Is not afraid, attacks the zone, can use that slider later in counts. Um, I thought he added a little bit more depth to it as the outing went on. Uh, and then the standout offensively on the night for me was Julius Banaris, future games alum, uh, had three hits, five RBIs, a grand slam. Uh, side note, I was on 95, um, or probably not on 95, probably like on 
whatever that road is coming into Manassas and Colgan. Uh, you know it, Nolan. I can, I know, I already know you're going to say what road it is. 234. There you go. See, I told you. Um, but I was on probably on that road uh, headed out. Um, same thing. It caught three or four at bats. Um, and they were getting ready to go to the, or they had just gone to the pen. Um, but, you know, good look overall, uh, especially for Banner Reese. Uh, just had a really solid night. And I think Colgan ended up winning that game like seven nothing. And he had five with RBIs. Um, I know Bassett had one RBI early. So, uh, yeah. All right. And then my Tuesday, um, absolute marathon zoo of a game, uh, showdown between number one and number two in our power 25, um, our preseason power 25, St. John's out at Paul, the sixth big showdown in the WCAC between the two, uh, back and forth affair, a 14, 10 game, Paul, the sixth hung an eight spot in the first, um, St. John's kept clawing back, got it to, I think it was 11 to nine at one point. And then Paul, the six put three more on in the bottom of the sixth. Uh, just, just an absolutely crazy game. I don't know. It was 11 to 10. Pardon me. Um, just a lot of mature at bats. I will say this before I start talking about arms and stuff like that. Uh, the, the one thing that was a big takeaway for me is, um, a lot of times when we go to high school games, uh, umpires will give, you know, two to four to 12 inches off the outside corner. And when you're an Auburn commit arm or a big time, yeah, big, big, when you have a big plate and you're a big arm throwing 87, 88 miles an hour, if you can throw the ball a foot off the outside corner, uh, not many hitters are going to do much with that. The one thing that was a big takeaway for me with that Paul the Six St. John's game, and the reason there was so much offense against good arms, is that they were calling a college strike zone. They were making the hitters or the pitchers throw the ball in the strike zone and attacking these hitters and the hitters were all being aggressive. They were taking good at bats. They were hitting hittable pitches and putting them in play on both sides. I mean, uh, Clayton Arma got the start for St. John's, the Auburn commit. It was uh, my first look at him this spring. Uh, he was up to 88, touched to 90 early, kind of held that velocity. Yeah. He gave up that eight runs in that first inning. He ended up throwing a scoreless second and a scoreless third. And no, Coach Gibbs was not abusing him from a pitch count standpoint. He gave up that eight runs in about 26 pitches because Paul the Six was just being really aggressive on fastballs in the zone and taking them the other way and doing a good job of putting barrel on the ball. Um, you had the first pitch of the game, Alex Peltier almost went yard to left center. The third pitch of the game, Jackson Saroy just missed a home run uh, off the top of the left center field fence. And then it was just good at bat after good at bat. Throughout the lineup after that, um, I will give Armas some credit. He did a really good job of fighting through that, um, adjusting his approach, continuing to battle, not getting frustrated, um, and giving his team those two good innings, getting out of that first, giving the second and third so that the offense could get going and start chipping away. Uh, so a real good showing there from him. He also did some things at the plate offensively, had a couple of really good at-bats. He hits in the three spot. First St. John's um, up to middle approach, he lined out there in that first one, and then late in the game got a single to fall into center field. Um, so I, I liked the approach from them. Um, offensively, I know we talked about him last week a little bit, the Maryland commit, the center fielder, the leadoff guy. For St. John's, he led the game off. He also jumped on the first pitch of the game, uh, went with a double deep to center field, and that is Nate Houghton Henley, the 2025 Future Games alum. Um, he had a couple of hits on the game as well, so he had that double right there. He's going to have a single later on in the game. Uh, made some big plays um, throughout the game as well, as he's a big part of what St. John's does um, offensively. Um, and then I did get a chance to see he came in at the end of the game and, um, and that was Marcus Martin uh, came in in relief for St. John's uh, got up to 9091 uh, Coastal Carolina commit a senior um, fastball. He looks really good from the windup. Uh, he had some issues once he got into the stretch that day. But overall, that was a pretty good showing there from Marcus Martin, or at least I like the stuff. So there was a lot of velocity. There was a lot of good approaches and a lot of good at-bats. There's a ton of energy. It was a fun atmosphere. I know it was March, what, 18th, uh, 19th, but it certainly felt like it was the WCAC championship game there because it's the only time those two will meet this year until the playoffs. So there's a lot on the line there. Um, it's enough of me rambling. Let's go ahead and throw it back to Jordan. Uh, third game you got to was Trinity Episcopal and Atlantic Shores. Jordan, what you got there? Yeah, um, 
what stood out to me immediately uh, when the game started, uh, 2027, Angelo Banks, he got the start, and he was impressive. And what really impressed me was he showed the ability to land uh, two different breaking balls for strikes, and he could throw whenever he wanted to. Um, he did a good job locating his fastball, setting up for the breaking ball. But, I mean, he'll throw the breaking ball, uh, curveball to set you up, then a uh, filthy sharp breaking slider that uh, just put hitters away uh, throughout the start. Um, so it was super intriguing with him. Hit fastball was 81, 84. But, I mean, if you have the ability to throw two elite breaking ball, high school elite breaking balls, I mean, you can do some damage. Uh, he only allowed two hits in the start, picking up six strikeouts and five in the third. So uh, I, I really I really like the start from him. It's an intriguing freshman to follow. And then um, Brett Beasley for Atlantic Shores, uh, he's just fun to watch at the plate. He brings energy. I really like the takes, the approach that he has. Um, his first A-B, he saw a first, first pitch slider, and pitcher came back to it, and he threw it again, and Brett did not miss it, hit a missile into right. So it was good to see him um, be able to hit spin and adjust pitch to pitch. Um, and then for Trinity Pisco, Jalen German got to start for Trinity. He was scattered early. He worked into deep counts, but, I mean, he seemed to always find a way out of the inning, making a very important pitch. Um, he was 85 to 88 with the fastball, uh, but touched 90 and 92 one time each. Um, so it's definitely some life there with the fastball. The slider was inconsistent throughout the start. Uh, he showed feel for it early, then will lose it. But uh, he gained a uh, feel for it later in the start. But just having the consistency uh, with the secondary will be very important for him going forward. But, I mean, it's a lot to like when you look at the metrics and things like that for German. And then uh, lastly, um, Lawson McLeod, uh, 2026 right-handed pitcher, he came in for relief. And um, he was pretty solid. He was 88-91. He held the velo fairly well. Um, fastball was working the corners, jumps on hitters. He's 6'5", lanky. So it's, when he releases the ball, it seems like it's right there on the hitters. Um, he flashed a slider. Um, it was 88-2. It was real firm, but it was more of a cutter shape. I know that uh, he's still developing feel, and um, he's changing, working with different groups for the slider um, when I talked to him before the game. But, I mean, uh, it's a lot to like. Uh, with him, uh, future projection especially. But, I mean, he got some swing and miss in the outing, four strikeouts in the inning and two-thirds. So, I mean, not too bad it was an uh, outing for McLeod that it, uh, on Wednesday. All right. And Wednesday, um, let's go ahead and go to you, Burt, for your Wednesday. Three days in a row, Northern Virginia, Light Ridge and Dominion. Uh, you got there early from this one. I did very early. Um, and, obviously, the obvious reason – uh, is to see James Nunley BP, um, as well as some other bats, but definitely, uh, you, you come for Nunley and, uh, and you get everything else, uh, in addition to, uh, it was 25 mile an hour winds blowing directly out of like center, right, center, right field. And when I tell you he launched baseballs, uh, he absolutely demolished baseballs. I joked with a few scouts, like he had like 60. He had like 60 raw power uh, in a 25 mile an hour wind uh, during during that BP session. Uh, Nolan, I know you've been to Light Ridge. I mean, to uh, Dominion in the trees out behind uh, center and right field, like some pretty good sized trees, some oak trees and stuff. And he was halfway up, like plucking them off of the trees. Yeah, th um, those are some mature was, trees. They've been there for a minute. So, yeah. Yeah, and and he was losing baseballs left and right. Uh, Donovan Newell lost a couple as well. Um, righties didn't have as much luck, um, but if you were a lefty on that day, it was an easy one to get the ball up in the air. Um, <clears throat> Caden Succi came out and started. was up to 91 uh, early on. I thought the curveball was better than the slider uh, on the day. Uh, showed a few change-ups, got some swings and misses up in the zone on the fastball. Uh, when he got to the second inning, the velo kind of was, was really up and down that inning. But, again, these are some guys that were thrown into a 20, 25-mile-an-hour headwind as a pitcher. Um, so it was it was definitely a different a different day to be a pitcher that day. Um, and then uh, the arm that really won the day was Mason Sprout for Light Ridge. He dominated his outing. Um, I saw him early on last year. I think, what, this was week – this was week two this year. I saw him week one, I think it was last year. Yeah, I think you year. saw him opening night last year. Opening night, I thought. Yeah, I saw yeah. him really early. It was versus it was versus OP, I believe. 
Uh, I thought he just moved so much better. The body looked better. Um, last year, he didn't really show the breaking ball because he was just kind of getting back into things from surgery. Um, he just looked much more comfortable. The breaking ball, obviously, uh, he, it showed better. He showed it in general. Um, the velo held pretty well. He had some carry through the zone on the fastball. I thought overall it was a really, really strong performance. Um, and then there were two, uh, one underclass bat and then one junior bat. Uh, you got Jimmy Burpo, uh, who is now starting second baseman. Uh, started at shortstop last year. Uh, pretty simple approach, pretty quiet, good bat to ball skills. Um, I would say above, above average bat speed. Uh, delivered some hard hit balls up the middle. And then one of my favorite hitters in the 26 class, Ben Drinkwine. Big physical kid. And just, I mean, just to put it simply, the kid just hits. Uh, see, he gets down in the lower half there, elevates that ball, sack fly to a fairly deep left center field to score a run. Um, just just a really strong offensive group for uh, for that Light Ridge team. I mean, there's not many there's there's not many kind of dead outs, especially in that first five, six, seven of that order. Um, you got Donovan Newell at the front end. Um, I think uh, oh, Tyler Rowling is hitting in the two. He hit an absolute bolt out of center field um, in what was I guess maybe his fourth at bat. Um, he can defend it short. Like it's just it's a really strong team all the way around for Light Ridge. Oh, all right, so that was Light Ridge Dominion. That was your Wednesday. Let's go ahead and jump ahead to my Thursday. Uh, uh, hopped it on over to Alexandria and begrudgingly sat in Beltway traffic, but we'll get to that another time. That's not West Potomac or Alexandria City's fault. Um, so uh, catch a pair of 2025 arms to see uh, Austin Dean and Liam Jones uh, facing off here. So uh, West Potomac... Ended up losing this game. Alexandria City jumped all over um, West Pot there in that second inning, especially against Dean. Um, big rally, some errors behind him, a couple misplayed fly balls, uh, just some really good at-bats from Alexandria City as uh, they came out and they jumped out big. Um, I'll give West Potomac credit. They did a really good job of fighting back and uh, not getting 10 run and hanging on and trying to push the game back into it. And they actually did a good job on Friday night too. They came out um, – uh, they're playing on PPN against Centerville, which I'll talk about here briefly in a couple of minutes, um, and did a good job of rallying and coming back with a win there. But uh, the big ones were the arms. Um, Austin Dean, the 2025 left-handed Virginia Tech commit. Um, I got to admit, I really like the way the arm works. I, I see it. He's big. He's tall. Uh, it was 86-87. He got an 88 in the first inning. Um, was mostly 6-7 to seven there. Really, really, really leaned on a slider a lot in that first inning which was 76 to 78 um, that helped him out quite a bit. He got a bunch of punch outs in that first inning uh, too, I believe uh, could have had another one. Uh, another case here of the umpire calling an over the plate strike zone for the most part. Um, so some good at bats from Alexandria city. They were able to fight off a lot of pitches and make Dean work. And then uh, again, they punished him a little bit in the second inning, which is, Unfortunate, but that's the way it goes sometimes in high school. There's a lot of projection left. That kid is far, far, far from a finished product. Um, I definitely absolutely see what Tech is seeing in him. And while that was a bit of a down outing, his second outing, just uh, talking with his dad, knowing what we've seen from him before, be willing to bet that there was maybe a touch of it's the second outing, a little dead arm going. Because that was also something I think I saw a little bit here in Liam Jones, uh, 2025 uncommitted right-handed pitcher from Alexandria city. He was also 86, 87, um, early, uh, showed a breaking ball. It was a little more of a curveball, 73, 74. Um, he threw well, uh, we've had his velocity 88, 89 at a scout day in February. Um, he was a little higher last week. Uh, I will say that he did hold his velocity. I popped the gun back up in the fourth inning. He was still pounding away at 86. Um, so that held, I like the athletic frame, the arm works there. Um, so there are some good things to like in Liam Jones. So if you're a coach looking for a, a right-handed arm and there was a coach or two there to watch him on Thursday night, uh, make sure you guys are reaching out and hustling on there. He's one of the better ones that remains uncommitted in that 25 group right now. Um, so, again, that was uh, Alexandria City's victory over West Potomac on Thursday. Um, yep. And let's go ahead and throw this back to Burton for Spotsy and Culpepper, where you went on Thursday night. Yeah, uh, solid, solid game. Uh, it was pretty tight, you know, through, throughout. Um, 
Ty, Tyrus Nobbs for Culpepper, uh, really strong outing for him. Strike thrower, low 80s, um, held his velo, competed in the zone, uh, didn't get to the breaking ball to the second or third inning, really just tried to kind of dominate with the fastball early. Uh, again, strike thrower, competes, arm works. Uh, and then also for Culpepper, Gal- Gavin Alvarado started shortstop, um, had a few walks and worked some A-B and stuff like that shows his athleticism at short lean lean strength uh athletic frame moves well um i don't know long term if he sticks it short but the athleticism is there to allow him to move around to some different positions and the foot speed is as well uh and then we move over to uh one of the main reasons uh i went was josh perez uh right hander from spotsylvania um you know, like up and down outing, I guess you could say. Um, he has some command issues at times, but the arm is absolutely electric. It is just a demon bowling ball sinker. Uh, first two pitches he threw were 90, 91. I was like, okay, here we go. Um, and showed the breaking ball a little bit. I really like some of the changeups that he turned over. It's high end arm speed. Uh, it's still raw. There's still a ton of polish to add. It's a durable frame. Really a lot to like about him. And then Jake, I hope I pronounced this right, Erbst. That's what I'm going with. Uh, shortstop, he kind of showed up like in 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 pregame. I saw, he, you know, he's got the bright cleats on uh, and, and the body and the way he moved and the way he handles himself in pregame. Uh, so I, I knew we had something there um, to, to really get a look on. Uh, line drives, middle backside, wider stance, athletic. Uh, I would say slightly above average runner. Um, he can defend in the middle. The hands work. Um, average arm strength came in. Uh, really low side arm to subby slot, upper 70s. Uh, just a good athlete. All right. Uh, Jordan, I skipped you last time. Sorry about that. Um, let's go ahead and go back to you. Uh, Atlantic Shores and Greenbrier. So you got to see Shores a couple times this week, huh? Yeah. Um, so Greenbrier, they came out throwing haymakers early. They really took advantage of some walks. Um, and then uh, Michael Irvin had start, got the offense started going. Um, he had a hard hit single on a fastball. It was upper 80s on the outside half. Um, he went on to have a multi-hit night. Um, he's super aggressive to plate, looking to crush anything that comes across the plate. Um, I like the approach behind the plate, some arm strength. He's really tough back there. He shows the will to really block balls behind the plate. So there's a lot to like for the long will commit. And then for also for Greenbrier, Thomas Conner at uh, 2025 VMI commit. He was also impressive. He only picked up one hit on the night, but everything was hard hit contact uh, when he came up. He showed an approach, ability to use the whole field. Um, and then Tucker Roop came in on the back end in relief, and um, he was effective. He used his big breaking ball. He, he, I think he threw maybe like four consecutive times as soon as he hopped on the mound. Um, he got out. It was a low 80s fastball, but, I mean, the breaking ball was effective. And then for Atlantic Shores, Brett Beasley, um, yeah, I know I talked about it offensively, but he came on in relief, and uh, he really surprised me. Um his stuff was electric. It was 87, 90, touch 91, but the slider was the difference maker. Um, came in real in the slider, got swings and misses. It was firm at 79, 81 um, with some depth, and he picked up quite a few strikeouts on, on it as well. But, I mean, it's plenty of intrigue with his two-way ability, so I'm really interested to see um, how he keeps going with his development on the mound for sure. All right. Maybe probably uh... – no, I was going to say Urbaniak's probably most complete offensive catcher in the state, regardless of class. It just hits. Hitters hit, man. Um, speaking of hitters hitting, uh, my Friday got over to PPN. Uh, Big Northern Virginia tournament started Friday night. Uh, I think VBCA is co-hosting it. Um, and, yeah, I know we still got to get to you for one more game, Bert. Um, and then um, – Mostly was locking in on Battlefield. Herndon, entertaining game. Battlefield jumped out uh, 6-1 in the top of the second inning. Herndon rallied back, actually took the lead 8-6 to six in the bottom of the sixth. And then Battlefield calmly rallied for um, four more runs in the top of the seventh. Uh, the, the, the big jump out one here was in the first inning, at the first pitch that he saw. 2027, Teagan Leach with his third double in two days. Just absolutely demolished this pitch to left center field. 
uh, big physical kid. We talked about him last week when I got a chance to see him pitch. Um, big impact offensively for him there, two RBI double um, early in the game. Also saw um, Yogi Colangelo um, had a similar double beats the center fielder over the top of his head. That ball nearly went out to dead center into a wind at PPN, um, which would have been like 380, 390 foot shot. Goes for a triple for him. Um, absolutely killed that baseball. He had two or three balls like that uh, that he hit on the day, showing a lot of power there for a freshman. Again, both of those kids are 2027s. Um, we've talked ad nauseum about Battlefield. Um, we've talked about those 2027s, but one who had some really good at-bats late, hammered a couple of balls, is actually their 2026 third baseman, Garrett Camp. Um, he, again, saw him pitching. That ball's a line out basically to the third baseman, caught on a short hop, threw him out. Um, in that seventh inning rally, he's going to line this ball in the left center, makes it 8-7, to seven and puts the tying run and scoring position here for them. Um on the Herndon side of things, I was kind of impressed. 2026, Charlie Morgan um, had a couple of at-bats where he just absolutely barreled balls. He's really, really good backside. Uh, this ball was a line out. This one actually gave them the lead here in the bottom of the sixth. Um, so good showing from him. And then obviously when there's four games going on, you can't just stand there and watch the whole time. So I got a little greedy and popped around, got a chance to see Alex Gonzalez from McLean. This was in his third inning. He was 85 at the time. Breaking ball came in at 77. He's a 2025 uncommitted right-handed pitcher. Uh, we got a chance to see him at first pitch. Arm works. I like the way the breaking stuff works. Uh, looks Looked good in that short little burst I caught. And then, of course, I walked over, and I saw one Caleb Williams at bat for West Springfield. And what's he do? Doubles off the left center field fence. Uh, Caleb Williams, 2025 VCU commit shortstop. Uh, Bert, what was your quote tweet on that one? Uh I uh, can't remember. He just plays. Every time I look on Twitter, we're at his game and the kid's just hitting. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Cam Eck, our other Northern Virginia guy, had been out to see West Springfield on Tuesday and the Friday previously, and he, he's lined a double somewhere each time up. So uh, good showing from them. Uh, I'll be back out there again this week, definitely on Tuesday, so we'll have some more coverage from that as we go. Um, Burton, I believe you have one game left here. Uh, your Friday game, Bishop O'Connell and Collegiate. Yeah, O'Connell, I don't want to say they dominated that from the beginning because it was pretty low scoring early on, or no scoring early on. Um, and I thought that the pitching staff uh, for Bishop O'Connell had a really good approach coming in. Um, it's It seemed pretty evident uh, that they were going to soften those Collegiate uh, kind of the Bash brothers and, and the the donkeys in that in that lineup, um, they were going to soften those guys up and work backwards and and kind of force them to to beat themselves really. Um, and I thought Jack uh, I thought Jack Rampy and Drew Markey did a really good job of that. Um, both kind of in the in the low to mid eighties range. Um, Rampy just a, a heavy bowling ball sinker. I loved him when I saw him last year. Kid pitches. Um, and he just like spun and change up and spun and change up to those guys early on. And they just, they wanted no parts of that. Um, he dominated, uh, went fairly in depth on, on Rampy and Marky in the scout blog that comes out tomorrow. So make sure y'all check that out. Uh, but I, I thought the arms dominated and then the scoring got started with Truman Leckie, uh, hit an absolute. Yes, I left the sound on that on purpose, Nolan. Uh, no, no, the sound needs to be on on that. And actually, we're going to play it again one more time just so everyone's paying attention and listens. All right. This is Has that ball landed yet? Green, yeah, there's a giant green monster in left field, and there was no doubt that that thing was clear of that. Um, he annihilated that pitch, he, uh, and that started it off one nothing. Um and, and then it was just kind of – they rolled after that. They got some walks. Uh, they they worked some at-bats, had some clutch hits. Um, guys worked counts. But I thought, like, best look of the day. The pitchers were really good, but best look of the day was Noah Hot. Um, started at shortstop. It is an advanced arm across the infield. Uh, he went out and took some pregame. It was just really a couple, a couple, of, uh, a couple of infielders out there. And some of them had – Numbers on, he didn't, you know, he was showing off his added strength and his uh, what compression long sleeve or whatever, uh, but he didn't have a number on, so I didn't know if it was him or Powell. I thought it was him, 
Um, he's not as not as long and lanky as, as Powell is. Um, but I texted Jordan. I was like, man, this kid has just an absolute chooch across the infield for an arm. Uh, I mean, it is a hand cannon. It plays from short. He has the ability to stay there. Foot speed, uh, check swing. Like it was just an excuse me swinging bunt kind of thing when his first at bat was 3-2. Uh, he rolls a 4-0 to first base, beats a beats an infield single to the second baseman, gets out of the box, plays the game hard, can defend it short, showed better bat to ball, showed some of his added strength. I thought it was just a really good look, and, and they rolled. Um, I forget what the final was, 9-2 maybe, something like that. Um, but they kind of they kind of dominated. Um, I say from the beginning, it, it, they just set the tone early with that pitching staff. All right, so those are the games that we're at. Make sure you're following us on all of our socials. Um, let's go ahead and shift over here real quickly to the Commonwealth Classic. Um, that is coming up this weekend. Here, quick look at the bracket. Um, I know that doesn't look pretty on top of us, but that's the best I can do here in a pinch. Um, this will be Saturday. We'll play the quarterfinals and semifinals, and then next Monday, the championship game. Um, so that is the bracket. We'll have information rolling throughout the week. This is the second time that we have done this event. Um, so Mills Godwin won it last year over Hanover. Um, we ended up actually with two state champs in the field last year, Hanover winning class four Cox winning class five and VHSL this year. We're excited about that field. And we are actually moving the venue on Saturday to iron bridge Academy. So hopefully we don't have to randomly drive all the way to Charlottesville to find turf this time around. Knock on wood. Um, I'm not going to sit here and discuss specific players ahead of time. I don't think we will either. We kind of did that a lot in December, um, and we have matchup previews that are going to roll this week on Wednesday and Thursday. But I do want to discuss some storylines. So, Jordan, uh, what team are you most looking forward to seeing in this year's Commonwealth Classic field? Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Nasbin River. I, I mean, I know they're a scrappy, well-coached group. So, I mean, they have some names in that lineup that could cause problems for any team. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what they could do um, in the tournament this weekend. All right, Jason, same question. Who are you looking forward to seeing? And how is it not that first-round game on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, you know, we pray for those pitching matchups or we pray for those matchups. You know, I, I really hope that we get them. Um, I mean, perfect world, uh, Yoder versus Upchurch. Um on on Saturday, uh, that's perfect world. And then Zayak versus uh, Freedom and Burkholder, a little state, what state quarterfinal rematch. Um, so yeah, just just looking forward to seeing some of the talented arms um, that are going to be that are going to be in it. Um, and you know, with with Godwin's deep staff and a uh, three games in what three days, uh, does that pitching staff depth um, push them through to back to back? championships all right so uh jason you kind of half started talking about favorite jordan who do you think is the favorite is it the defending commonwealth classic champions or is there someone else on the table here yeah actually it is the defending champions because i just think the depth that they have on the mound i think that will get them through a three-day where some teams that may not have all that uh depth on the mound so i will i will say the champions from last year have are my favorite for this year all right, Jason, just uh, top of your head, who do you think is the favorite? Is it Godwin, as you were kind of hinting at, or are you going somewhere else here? Uh, uh, I'm taking freedom. Okay. I'm taking freedom. Somewhere, this somewhere Coach happened. Wright's clapping and smiling about that. Yeah, and, like, I think we're going to talk to him in, like, 10 minutes. He's in, like, Mexico or Guatemala or Guantanamo Bay or somewhere. Um but uh, yeah, I think I think it's the Eagles. It's been an up and down start. Um, still, they they got a few days off to come back healthy um, and ready to come in a big six match up for that first game. Um, and then I think, you know, Atley and St. Albans potentially lose their top arm in that first game, and it has to turn around and and face freedom in that nightcap. Um, so we'll see. All right. Uh, one more question each here. Jordan, who do you think is a dark horse to win this? We both kind of leaned on Godwin and Freedom. Who do you think of the other six could sneak through this that we're not necessarily talking about right now? Uh, Benedictine is going to be my dark horse team. I mean, they're, they're going to be able to defend. They have some talent on the mound. 
Um, I mean, just as long as the, they find enough offense, I think the pitching will definitely push them to get, get through this tournament for sure. Jordan, can the highest ranked Power 25 team be the Dark Horse? I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Well, I mean, if they're not the favorite, what are they then? <laughs> yeah, Look, yeah, I like, care about him. Oh, he's in his feelings now. He's uh, in his feelings now. Uh, you got them all no. flustered. I can see it no. on his yep. face right now. That a boy. No, not at all. No. I mean, I just I think. I had to get it before we signed. They have up. lost some guys. I mean, they have lost some guys from last year for sure off their roster. So they're still trying to figure out, like, who's going to be the man offensively for them. Um, but, I mean, like, they're not going to beat themselves. They're going to pitch it. They're going to defend. So, I mean, you got those things. We have a good chance. I, I will say this, Bert, and I know I'm kind of – hitting the previews here Adley's got some volume of arms where if they can find a way to scratch some runs throughout the tournament they could sneak through this thing they could uh, uh I, I hate to say my door my dark horse is in that first that that first matchup um is St Albans I think if they can get through Yoder if they can get him out of there early um, and they get a quality start out of Upchurch or Benner or or whoever uh, they throw. I mean, they got Desmaris. They have multiple arms. I think the biggest thing, like you look at you look at um, St. Albans' record, and they're five and six. We talked about it before we came on here. Those dudes have played ten games in like eleven days. There's I, I, even for Godwin. Godwin probably has the deepest staff in the state. Nobody's prepared at, at the high school level. Nobody's prepared for. 10 games in like 11 or 12 days, nobody. Um, and, you know, after looking at some box scores and stuff like that, they've pieced a lot of stuff together. So I think they're going to have a few days off. Uh, they play Jackson Reed midweek. Um, staff comes in healthy. They're seasoned. They've seen everything. They've been in Florida, played like five or six games, um, you know, versus I'm sure some quality competition. Uh, and I think they're going to be ready to go. All right. So again, keep an eye out for previews. We're going to have just some general information coming out Tuesday and then uh, matchup previews on Wednesday and Thursday on the website. And then uh, hustle on down to Richmond this weekend, uh, Saturday, uh, weather permitting, uh, fingers crossed. Um, it's going to be a wonderful Saturday of action. Uh, those first two games will be played side by side at, um, yeah, I'm already blanking. Great. Brain I have going right now side Iron by side Bridge. at Iron Bridge. Yeah, I don't know, man. My brain's in six places. Um, Iron Bridge, um, and then those games will move to RFMP for the semifinals on Saturday nights. So we'll be at either one, and then the championship game on Monday night at RFMP. So hustle on down. There should be plenty of awesome action for that. Um, also, we have announced our full early summer event slate and posted the Mid Atlantic Trials, the Summer State Games, the top prospect games. We even added a second top prospect games for our Road to Lake Point series this summer. Uh, Jason, any overall notes on all those? Yeah, if you want to get to UR top prospect games, um, I would imagine you need to do so in the next seven to 10 days. Uh, we are at 70, 71 registrations, uh, and we're going to cap it at like 80, 85. It's the, I think last year at this time, we had like 10 registrations, maybe uh, for that event. Um, so it's a pretty, uh, pretty popular event right now. Um, we have uh, a little over 100 for state games. Um, so if, if you haven't requested, go ahead and do so. Uh, and then obviously we have the other ones at uh, now Liberty and at Paul the Six Mid-Atlantic Trials um, and then junior, junior state games that you are the day after top prospect games. And one thing I will add, just as I'm going to say it every single time for Mid-Atlantic Trials, that is on um, May 18th, right? 19th. 19th. May 19th. 19th. It's the day after the private school state championships. It is very much in the middle of many public school seasons. We do not want public school kids signing up for that event unless their season is completely over, which none of you will know at that point in time. So that is targeted for private school kids. All right. Um, so – if you've not done so, make sure you're requesting your invites to those events. Um, we will sell them out. Uh, invites have gone out, so please make sure you're hustling on that. Uh, with that all said, I think that's just about a wrap on this episode. Uh, we'll have some short hits. We'll announce our player of the week tomorrow. 
Team of the Week on Tuesday. Keep an eye out on that, and then make sure you're following us on all of our socials, and we'll see you out there.